Okay, um, welcome everyone. To, <coughs> welcome everyone to this meeting of the Plus Parity Group on Race and Equality, the first of this Senate. Um, this meeting is being recorded and um, that will be very useful to those compiling the minutes which will be circulated after um, the meeting. Um, could everybody make sure they're on mute if they're not um, actually speaking uh, at a particular time. Um, we, we, we haven't got a great deal of time, um, one hour, um, so we, we'd really better crack on. And the first thing on our agenda today um, is the um, election of a chair. Um, so nominations and um, seconding has to be done, I believe, by Senate members. Um, so I hope there are some Senate members with us. Um, if there are, would anybody like to nominate for the position of chair? If not, we will um, we will return to it. Um, and Andrew, am I right in thinking it? Does it have to be Senate members that nominate, and it does? Yeah, that's right. I can I can see um, Sinead. Oh, sorry, Sinead. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'll nominate John Griffiths. Oh, thank you very much. So, is there then a second there? A second. It, but it has to be a, a Senate member. Oh. Um, John. Yeah, John, I'll second it. Oh, thank you, Matt Bond. That's great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that. That um, gets us over that formality. Um, we perhaps will return to the issue of um, a vice chair um, at, the, at the next meeting, perhaps, because we have very, I know, very little time today. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, thanks to everybody for joining our meeting today. Um, the first substantive item we have then is a um, question and answer session on the joint NGO um, Shadow United Nations report on racial inequality in Wales. And that will be um, presented by Christina Tanti, who's research and evaluation coordinator for race equality first. So I'm hoping very much that uh, Christina is with us at the moment. Christina? Yes, yes I, uh, I am here. Uh, for some reason, my name is coming up as Shainor, uh, so I'm not sure why that is, but just for those who don't know you, know me, my name is Christina, um, and I will be delivering a presentation today. Um, am Great. I all right to take that on with that? Yes. <laughs> okay, fabulous. Okay. So I'm going to be delivering a presentation today discussing some of the findings and um, recommendations in the joint NGO shadow report on racial inequality in Wales. Um, and within this, I'll talk a little bit about the surge shadow reporting process. So if you just give me one minute, I'll just uh, share my screen for you all. Okay, thank you. Okay, you should all be able to see the presentation, but let me know if you can't. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay, so to uh, start us off then, just let me explain that this report was put together with feedback from the Surd Steering Group for Wales and a number of civil society organisations in Wales who support ethnic minority people and know the, uh, the issues that they're experiencing in their daily lives. Um, and it's great to see some of you here today as well who actually contributed to the report. Thank you again for your input. Um, we try to get as much feedback as possible for the report and all the consultations that we did run were very rich sessions, um, which provided a wealth of information and data, anecdotal evidence and suggestions for change, which the report refers to and references throughout. Um, the UN's examination of the UK hasn't actually been scheduled yet, though, um, as a result of from the pandemic. Um, so we will have an opportunity 
to amend the report before its submission to the UN. So any suggestions are welcome. I will be putting my email address um, in the chat later today. Um, so you can send any feedback through um, to me that way or any questions. So that's, that's an opportunity for you to get in, in contact with me that way as well. And then finally, just before I get started, I just want to um, address a recurring comment that I've had about the report, which is that it focuses too much on data and numbers and pushing for better collection of data in some areas. Um, when people's lived experiences are very important and need to be listened to. So in response to that, I just want to say that I'm not suggesting that, that data should be considered as more valuable or important than people's lived experiences. The Shadow Report does also highlight people's lived experiences that were discussed at our consultations with organisations who assist ethnic minority individuals. And as well, a number of consultees were, were happy and willing to share their own experiences. And these are also included in the report. So I, I feel it's important to state that the purpose of the Shadow Report is to, is to illustrate the extent of racial inequality in Wales to the UN. And the UN has a need for an evidence based report, but that doesn't mean that we can't also make use of this report at a more local level as well. So I'm just going to give a, a more in depth overview of the stages we've gone through on the project to provide a better understanding on how we formulated the report. Um, the report was put together in a, a very short space of time. We had just six months from stage one to stage six. We organised a steering group comprising of eight individuals um, who have a wide range of expertise. Uh, steering group members came from academia, the third sector, health and social care, religious representational bodies and trade unions. Um, and the steering group played a supervisory role overseeing the production of the report and um, approving several drafts of the report as well. We had just five weeks to receive contribution from civil society on issues relating to racism in Wales. And we have fed back to the EHRC that this time frame was too short uh, for civil society to engage on um, how they would have liked to. So hopefully reporting processes um, for future cycles will be appropriately extended. Um, during this time, we promoted the project on social media to encourage contribution. Um, and we also organized uh, nine consultation events and we engaged 35 individuals from those who were from uh, 19 civil society organizations who have expertise in race and or religion. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these sessions were, were very rich. Uh, following the consultations, we conducted our own desk-based research, analyzing a wide range of secondary sources. And then we put together a shadow report taking into account the issues that were raised at consultation and from guidance uh, from our steering group as well. And then the first draft of the report was, was shared uh, for feedback from those who contributed and, and the steering group as well. Any amendments that were flagged at that stage were made before we launched the final report in July. And the final report is around um, 17,000 words and is endorsed by 63 signatories. So I'll just briefly explain what ICERD is um, and how CERD holds states to account on their race equality obligations. So ICERD stands for the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and it's an international human rights treaty. Um, and it was adopted in 1965. The UK ratified ICERD in 1969, which means um, that the UK agrees to take action to eliminate racial discrimination in all of its forms. CERD is the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, the committee consists of 18 experts that are appointed by state, part, state parties. And the committee sets recommendations to combat racial discrimination to be put into place by the state party government. Um, and the committee also holds uh, periodic reviews um, once every five years to identify how well state parties are holding the treaty and implementing recommendations. Uh, the last examination took place in 2016, so it, they, they were due to examine the UK again this year in 2021. Um, the process has taken a, a slightly different shape this year, however, um, as in the past, one non-government organisation has been funded to write the Shadow Report um, for the whole of the UK. However, this time round, devolved nations have been funded to write their own separate reports, which means that the issues specifically relating to racism in Wales have been highlighted in their own right to the UN for the first time. Uh, due to the pandemic, there have been delays to the production of the uh, state report and to UN committee sessions. Uh, the state report hasn't been submitted to CERD yet, despite the shadow report having been put together. Um, and this means that we don't know when CERD's examination of the UK will take place just yet. Um, but I will come back uh, and talk about this in a little bit more detail at the end of the presentation. Really quickly, um, it's just a word here. 
on, on some of the main issues and points that were raised at the consultations. Um, I will be talking through some of the findings outlined in the report by each topic next. I'm not going to have time to talk about every topic today, uh, but I will share the link to the report at the end. Um, please bear in mind that the points um, that are listed on the following slides don't cover every issue in that section of the report as well. I'm just going to be given a brief overview today. Um, and I also would like to say that I appreciate that the findings that I'll, I'll talk about next um, will largely be information that you're already aware of um, and have heard before. Um, as the inequalities that ethnic minority people face are, are not new. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the, the next few slides for that reason. Okay. <clears throat> Starting with education. <clears throat> Sorry. So ethnic minority children continue to face racial bullying in their day-to-day -day school lives. 85% of uh, people surveyed by Show of Racism the Red Card um, stated that they had experienced racism in school or in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, consultees raised concerns about teachers not being fully equipped to deal with racism robustly. Show of Racism the Red Card surveyed over a thousand teachers and found that nearly half did not feel confident in recognizing racism and only a third said they had uh, received training on how to recognize and respond to racism. Uh, consultees were also frustrated at a lot of incidents of identity-based bullying, including racial bullying, uh, going unrecorded. Estin also found that only a minority of schools in Wales have been keeping useful records about bullying. Uh, the educational attainment of Gypsy and Gypsy Roma children is the lowest of any ethnic group, uh, with only 11.1% achieving five or more GCSEs at grades A star to C. Um, our consultations talked about um, uh, there being a correlation between lack of support uh, in schools for Gypsy Roma and traveller families and their children then being electively home educated um, as families don't trust schools to keep their children safe and to safeguard them from bullying. And lastly for this topic today, digital exclusion. Ethnic minority children from a socially disadvantaged background and Gypsy Roma and traveller children in particular uh, face digital exclusion, uh, which the pandemic exacerbated. Uh, children struggle to access uh, tablets and laptops and in some cases uh, Wi-Fi, which obviously greatly impacted their ability to do their schoolwork from home. Um, in employment then, so uh, ethnic minority people are more likely to be in poorer paid and more precarious work. The employment rate for ethnic minorities in Wales is lower than the rate for the white population. Um, and alongside this, during the pandemic, ethnic minorities have been more likely to lose income or become unemployed, um, as they're more likely to work in sectors affected by the lockdowns. Um, a BBC test found that CVs submitted under a non-Muslim name are three times more likely to be offered an interview than those with a Muslim name. Um, and we also have um, the recent survey by, by ITV Wales and Unison, uh, which found that two thirds of ethnic minority NHS workers in Wales have experienced racism at work. And lastly, um, ethnic minorities are underrepresented in certain roles in Wales. In teaching, for instance, only 1.3% of teachers are from an ethnic minority background. And in policing, just 1.9% of police officers of police officers in Wales are from an ethnic minority background. Um, and then you can see on the slide there that the BME population in Wales is 5.6%. Uh, moving on to health, uh, ethnic minorities face stark disparities in health outcomes. Um, however, we don't have access to disaggregated data for Wales on health outcomes for different ethnic groups, uh, which, which can make it difficult to understand the health experiences of ethnic minorities in Wales. Nonetheless, in the UK, uh, black women are five times more likely to suffer maternal death and Asian women twice as likely compared to white British women. Alongside this, uh, ethnic minorities do not have equal access to healthcare in the UK. Sourcing an interpreter for medical appointments remains a barrier for, for ethnic minority people. Uh, Gypsy, Roma and traveller individuals have the poorest health outcomes by, um, of any other ethnic group. They have low life expectancy. Uh, one, one small study has estimated their life expectancy to be at least 15 years lower than the general population. Um, the suicide rate among these individuals uh, is more than six times higher than that of the general population in the UK. Um, Organisations who work with these populations have attributed the, the hate that they receive, have attributed the high suicide rates to the hate that they receive in their daily life, um, as well as struggles to access mental health support. And uh, some commentators are concerned that infant mortality and maternal death are the highest within these groups, uh, but the data sets on this are hidden as they're grouped together with the white or white other categories. 
And then lastly, COVID-19 and the rate at which ethnic minorities were dying from the virus compared to their white counterparts. Black people in Wales were nearly three times more likely to die from the virus than the white population in 2020. And then the last uh, topic that I'm going to talk about today is housing. Um, there were almost twice as many ethnic minority individuals living in private rented accommodation in Wales in 2019 compared to the white population. Um, ethnic minorities are disproportionately facing homelessness in Wales and are more likely to be living in overcrowded housing than the white population in Wales. Uh, looking at Gypsy Roma and Traveller housing, 2020 data shows that the number of authorised sites have increased by 38% since 2016 and the number of caravans on authorised sites have increased by 24% uh, since 2016. However, 11% of all caravans remain on unauthorised sites, despite the fact that local authorities in Wales have a duty to um, provide site accommodation for Gypsy Roma and Traveller individuals under the Housing Act. Um, several, several consultees were very concerned um, by the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill and its criminalisation of trespass, um, its ability to criminalise Gypsy Roma and Traveller families unfairly. And then lastly, looking at asylum seeker and refugee housing and the barrack style accommodation used to house asylum seekers and refugees and the low standard of housing that's provided by Clear Springs were also raised as concerns. Um, and consultees also raised how asylum seekers and refugees are at greater risk of becoming homelessness, uh, of, of becoming homeless, sorry, as the 28 day move on period doesn't allow enough time for arrangement of alternative accommodation. And there also being um, barriers to accessing private rented accommodation because of the deposit requirements. <clears throat> Um, so I'll just provide a quick summary just to tie everything that I, I spoke about into the main argument in the report, which is um, that an integral part of understanding ethnic disparities in Wales and across the UK comes from underst understanding structural inequality and institutional racism. Um, the main findings that I've just discussed show that the attainment of some ethnic minority children is hampered by experiences of racism in their everyday school lives, uh, by a lack of role models in an education workforce that does not reflect the ethnically diverse profile of Wales. Uh, inequalities also exist in the workplace with ethnic minorities being overrepresented in lower paid and more precarious work and underrepresented in uh, senior roles. Uh, this compounded with lower employment rates in general for ethnic minority people not only increases their likelihood of living in poverty, but also crucially allows these inequalities and institutional racism to perpetuate because ethnic minority people are not adequately represented to identify, remove and reform any structures or policies of, of racial discrimination. On top of this, as I've just mentioned as well, ethnic minorities are also facing poorer health outcomes and are more likely to live in, in overcrowded housing or in the less secure private rented sector. Okay, so um, here's a few recommendations um, in the report, um, and these recommendations were also formed um, from our consultations with civil society. Um, again, each of the, each section of the report has a list of recommendations, so I'm not going to be talking about all of them, of course, just uh, just two or three for, for each topic that I've referred to today. Um, starting with education again, the need for sustainable funding for designated members of staff who can support Gypsy Roma and Traveller children and their families with their needs at school was raised by the consultees, um, as was the need for mandatory training for all teachers on how to recognise and respond to racism. Uh, another recommendation for education is within the implementation of the new curriculum to ensure all schools are provided with adequate resources to teach ethnic minority histories in all areas of learning and experience and ensure all teachers are trained appropriately so they feel fully equipped to do this. Um, in employment, the need for more safeguarding procedures and aftercare was raised so individuals feel um, safe and, and feel able to raise a grievance in the workplace without risk of, intimid of intimidation. Also for an action plan to recruit more ethnic minority teachers in Wales to be set out ensuring the retention and progression of these teachers. Uh, recommendations around health in, um, include improving data collection on health outcomes and ensuring disaggregated data on health outcomes by ethnicity in Wales is collected and made publicly available so we can better understand um, inequalities and improve health outcomes mm -hmm. for ethnic minority populations. And alongside this, improving access to mental health services for ethnic minorities in Wales. And lastly, for housing, to ensure adequate site provision is provided for Gypsy, Roma and Traveller people in Wales. 
uh, to work to disapply the police crime sentencing and courts bill in Wales and work with the police and local authorities to mitigate the impacts of the bill. Um, and also to increase the supply of social and affordable housing in Wales and to prior prioritise uh, already overcrowded housing mm -hmm. uh, households um, on social housing waiting lists. So those are just a, a few um, of the recommendations in the report. There are lots of other speech section uh, that are also important. OK, just before I run quickly through what will happen next in, in this reporting process following the production of the Shadow Report, uh, before wrapping up this presentation, um, I felt it was important to briefly highlight the main differences and similarities in the England and Wales reports in relation to eliminating racial discrimination. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the first time that there has been a separate report for Wales. Um, so I'll start with the differences. Um, the UK government's and the Welsh government's commitment to tackling racial inequality does differ. In many ways, Wales shows a strong commitment to the advancement of racial equality. Um, as we all know, Welsh government is working on its racial equality action plan. Um, and within the REAP, uh, Welsh government has acknowledged the issue of institutional racism and, and structural inequalities. Uh, similarly, Wales has put together a new school curriculum to be put into place in 2022. And Wales is stated aim to make Wales a nation of sanctuary with its refugee and asylum seeker action plan, uh, which also sets it apart from England in its commitment to make Wales a safe place for asylum seekers and refugees to call home. Um, England, on the other hand, has not made such commitments with a race quality action plan and has instead denied the existence of institutional racism. Um, in the 2021 report by the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, Another issue um, is the lack of disaggregated data with full ethnicity breakdowns, which makes it difficult to pinpoint issues in certain areas and to understand exactly where improvements are needed, um, as a lot of data is grouped together for England and Wales and English data sets can dominate. So that's uh, re um, reflected in a, in a few recommendations. In terms of similarities, uh, both the English and Welsh Shadow Reports talk about their concern with recent and upcoming UK government legislation and its impact on ethnic minorities' rights in England and Wales. Uh, notably, the new immigration rules that allow the deportation of any migrants sleeping on UK streets and the Police Crime Sentence and in Courts Bill, uh, which will criminalise trespass. Um, so it's important to understand that despite Wales' stronger commitment to tackling racial inequality, as several key policy areas are reserved for Westminster, the Welsh Government are limited in, in what they can do in, in some policy areas, and the UK Government's denial of race issues does have an inevitable adverse impact on ethnic minorities in Wales. And lastly then, what will happen next in this process? So as I mentioned earlier, the UK State Report has been delayed. So that needs to be drafted um, and submitted to CERD. Following that, CERD will schedule the UK examination and when it does come around, we will attempt to present evidence. And lastly, as per the CERD process after the examination where both government and civil society have given evidence on the issues relating to racism in Wales um, and the rest of the UK, the committee will then put together um, a list of recommendations to the UK and devolved governments for implementation. And that's everything. Thank you for listening today. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, the UN's examination of the UK hasn't been scheduled yet um, as a result of delays from the pandemic. So there will be an opportunity for us to amend the report before its submission to the UN. So suggestions are welcome. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat in a moment um, and you can send any feedback to me that way or any questions, you can send them to me that way as well. That's fine. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Um, thank you, Christina. I'm, I've been told that John has briefly lost his connection. Are you back, John? No. Um, I think there's about five minutes where we might be able to have some questions. Um, yeah, sure, that's fine. I, I can see Jack one. Is that a hand up from Jackie? We probably will only be able to take two questions. So just, uh, I'm Babeline, so. Thank sure. you. Is it OK to start? Yeah, it's OK. Thank you very much. That was a really great um, report. And I've been involved with the gender report to the UN. So I know how hard it is to, to get everyone to know. So fantastic job and 17,000 words. Um, 
I have a question about uh, previous examinations, whether you're covering those uh, those things that have already been held, the UK has already been held lacking specifically in Wales, and um, whether we have any UK representation on third as well, or whether you're advocating for that too, and domestication of the UN convention itself. Thank you. So in terms of the first question, um, sorry, can I just ask for you to just sort of specify what you mean in terms of the UK element of it? Um, well, it, it's previous reports, um, how they have had um, not implemented certain aspects, and are you highlighting okay. those things as well? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, because this time around there's been um, a Welsh report and, a, and an English report, the English report has covered that in a lot more detail and has really gone in on the areas in which um, the UK government has failed to sort of uphold previous recommendations and as well other issues that have, have advanced um, in the past five years. So that's covered more so in, in that report and I can sort of drop you the link to that as well if, you, if you're interested in having a look at it. And um, just because they, they, were, they were separate this time around and we wanted to not kind of overlap um, on each other. Um, but the areas in which the UK government does affect Wales, that has been highlighted in this report as well, because um, unfortunately there, there are limitations on, on what we can do. Um, so there are a number of recommendations around um, sort of urging the UK government to do certain things. Um, and of course, those, those court, you know, that sometimes can fall on, on deaf ears. Um, and then the, the second question that you asked about um, domestication of, of the um, of the of the treaty in in the UK so do you mean sort of accepting it into um the law and the yeah uh, that's also something that's been pushed for as well um and it is it that is recommend uh, recommended in the in the UK report and yeah something that we're also hoping for and would like to see in the future thank you uh Bablin. thanks Rocio um um yeah, thanks. Great report, um, Christine, um, and some great recommendations have come out. So it's, it's interesting to see. I wanted to just pick up on, I know um, you've kind of, you know, this ethnic minority and then you've, you know, this specific point about traveling community. Um, but I was just saying, is that, did you find any difference within the black community or within the South Asian community, within your ethnic minority um, groupings, basically? Did you explore it to that level, basically? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so certain sort of, I know there's a, there's a, a debate at the moment about sort of terminology and sort of not referring to um, ethnic minorities as a whole, but sometimes, unfortunately, we, we do need to do that. Um, parts of the report do sort of talk about different ethnic groups where we can and, and highlights different issues. So, for instance, if... Um, sorry, um, sorry uh, and if certain issues are affecting certain communities sort of um, uh, black communities or Asian communities in, in more detail then that's something that's highlighted within the report so you know if there's a specific recommendation that is needed we have tried our best to do that I'm just trying to see if John is back um, I, there's been an issue with the names for some reason and we have about six people called Andrew Bettridge so yeah, I'm sorry about that. Russia. Are any of you? No, I don't think any of them are, John. <clears throat> uh, I'm just trying to get hold of John Russia, as we speak. Okay, we can probably just take a few more questions in that case, um, because the next agenda item is the Deputy Minister, um, J the, the Minister Jane Hutt, and I also haven't seen her arrive. So I'll take a question from Rob Yu and uh, Siva then. Thank you for the report and and thank you, Rocio. Um, yeah, my question just really relates to, I guess, um, uh, representation and whether the report covers, you know, I think it talks about employment and other aspects, but in terms of public representation, is that something that the report covers and talks about? Because I think we do need leadership in this area and I wonder whether there's any aspect of that as well that's referenced. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the report does talk about sort of um, the lack of ethnic minority people um, in politics at the minute, in public appointments, uh, local politics uh, on a more national scale as well, um, and, and the Welsh government as well in the Senate. So we have sort of referenced that and, and that's something that's highlighted and the importance of needing um, in sort of more role models in leadership in Wales um, from an ethnic minority background. That is definitely something that, that's highlighted and there's um, a few recommendations within the report in that section as well.
Thank you. And um, question from Siva. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, all. Um, interesting report and very comprehensive. Obviously, a lot to take in. Uh, to start off, I did put it on my uh, uh, chat message whether we could have a copy, unless it's been out, but I haven't been on top of my um, emails. But anyway, the, one of the con con concerns I have is in terms of all the figures that's been um, included in the report, is there any comparison between what has happened in terms of the similar report, in terms of the figures, are we actually making any progress? What I can't gather from this report, it's like a state of the art in, in where we are now in terms of all the figures, right? Are we making any comparison? And then also to find out exactly why. I know some, one of the earlier questions was, you know, some of the, the previous report hasn't been implemented by certain parties. Obviously that could be one of the reasons, but the other one I'm also trying to find out virtually, we had to drill into every one of those data you are looking at as to why certain things hasn't, haven't been identified previously has been lacking in certain progress. So why are we not making a move on those certain figures? And then we need to really put that drill down and then go, go out to those people who are supposed to be doing something about it. Because I think all the information, obviously the topic is virtually has been going around all the time. Okay, we know that racism exists, but what we want to do is to make progress. So we need to have not only obviously what you've done is good. Don't don't, don't take me wrong. It's good, but we need to compare and and chart the pro, um, uh, progress we are making. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I haven't had the chance to have a look at the um, the the comments in the chat. I will check in a moment once um, once I get five minutes, and I will put the link in there to the report if you haven't had a chance to have a look at it, or anybody else who hasn't had hasn't hasn't had chance to have a look at it, and you can sort of have a look at it in more detail. Um, no, it's, it's a very, very good point, and I, I totally appreciate that. You know, there's there's a lot of frustration that we're having the same question, uh, same questions and answers, and same conversations, and we, we know the issues relating to racism in Wales, and we know, um, you know, we, these problems have been happening for a long time. So I completely agree with you there. Um, the report does sort of compare sort of the situation to Wales now to, from five years ago, so it has that element of comparison in it. Um, you know, but we're hoping that this time round, with it being the first time that Wales has had an opportunity to take part in its own right on it on an international forum. Welsh government will be you know listening and as well with the, with the sort of the time that, that we have at the minute with the with the work that's being done on, on the, the Welsh government reap as well. Hopefully, um, you know, we will start to see changes being made, but I completely understand the, the level of frustration that that we are having the same conversations and, and that we need to be seeing progress and, and we know the issues. So I, I do completely recognize that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, are you back with us? Russia, he's having problems with still. He's on the phone to IT now. Um, okay. I've joined you though. Um, oh, oh well, welcome. Now. <laughs> welcome Managed to get in. Welcome. Thank um, you. Yes, I'm just covering because John's having IT problems and everyone is called Andrew Bettridge on this call, very strangely. So um, welcome, Minister. Um, it's lovely to have you. And um, you are arriving at the right time because we're just um, discussing the excellent report from Race Equality First. And a lot of the questions have been about what happens next um, and how will those recommendations be implemented so it's a, a very a very good segue into your um, agenda item, Minister, on good. the update well, on the Race Equality Action Plan. So welcome and over to you, Minister. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I just picked up on, on those points about the report and, and, and heard from Shahino about the response. Actually, I've also arranged, I think you'll be aware, um, a special meeting for us to have, um, to have the, the report presented to the Race Equality um, Forum. Uh, it needs a proper meeting because, you know, on an agenda, busy agenda, we, you would only get a, uh, a short period of time. So we've organized that and obviously for our officials. So yes, I mean, really looking forward to having that and how it, and then, you know, what we can do within our powers and how it relates to the Race Equality Action Plan, as you said, is crucially important. So, uh, 
and, and that now's the time to do it because I thought if I just give <clears throat> a quick update on where we are time wise and where we've been what we've been working with over the, over the last few weeks and months in terms of responding to the consultation uh, on the race equality action plan for an anti-racist wealth I always want people to say a full title a race equality action plan for an anti-racist Wales because that is the crucial thing is that that should be which will have to make that kind of difference we're talking about that we've been talking for years and yet what is going to make is this going to make that change to an anti-racist Wales in fact I think we ought to call it the uh, an anti-racist Wales race equality action plan because it's so important that we we recognize it from that point of view now um, the consultation attracted a high level uh, of engagement. We had a total of 330 responses um, received and they came through a variety of methods. You know, a lot of you and uh, many people were involved in uh, meetings which we sponsored. We gave uh, small grants to community groups uh, um, reports came through that because, you know, the usual to send out a thing and re reply consultation it doesn't work in most policy contexts really but it was very important that we did it differently so we had a lot of online messages we had a dedicated mailbox uh, we had videos recorded interviews minutes of meetings they've all so there's a huge amount that have come in in different in, in very different ways from perhaps consultations that we've had on other policy areas um, but you know, some some stakeholders had full responses to everything. Others focused on particular points and recommendations in the action plan. We did go out to uh, to, to get a, a provider, an independent provider, to analyse all the responses. Um, and there was a, a tender process, and Race Equality First um, was successful in that. So obviously, that's a huge job of work to do um, for race equality first to analyze all the responses important that we did have an independent we have got an independence in terms of that analysis and i hope that would give some confidence as well um, so there will be a bilingual uh, and summary report there'll be a sort of summary of all responses that people can look at which will help um, inform us and strengthen the plan um, but obviously our officials also across the whole of Welsh Government are reviewing the responses um, before we get the analysis. Uh, but I mean, I think what's been positive, because of, we had such a lot of engagement before the plan was produced, uh, that actually people have a sense, come, have coming back with a sense of ownership of the plan already. Um, and to, to uh, but uh, saying that this is about determination to make change. I get, it's going to be a practical document that comes out of all of this because we have, you know, we have the plan. So this will be sort of um, uh, ensuring that we fulfil the responses with really practical, practical actions. So, you know, um, clarity about what change will take place. We've got to have very um, clear uh, indication of what outcomes will be achieved, not just a list of actions, what will be the difference that will come out of that. You know, we have had lots of discussions and um, we've had them in um, the Race Equality uh, Forum about what we, acronyms and the fact that things, and that kept, there was quite a bit of response that BAME remains and we won't use it, contentious, we don't use that anymore. Um, black, Asian, minority, ethnic, but there's still many, different, um, with, with that's still a discussion, a debate discussion that we need to, to have. Um, so we, about the best views, this is something perhaps the cross-party group will have a view on as well. Um, and in fact saying that, um, you know, Welsh ethnic minorities seldom heard, underserved we know, um, is something which is coming out uh, a, a, a crucially important. So there's those, those issues coming through, but we've got to look at whether there are going to be changes or amendments to the plan, because obviously many of you are involved in developing the plan, but it's how do we forge that uh, truly anti-racist Wales 
the governance and accountability has come up so much. Uh, and that accountability and governance issue is about implementation. And then how do we check whether anything's happening? You know, we, we've got quite a lot of plans where, you know, people feel they, after the consultation, well, what's the ownership and the mo monitoring and implementation is, is crucial. So I think the plan in itself is quite, I know it sounds a big term, revolutionary, but actually it's a very different way of trying to make a policy document actually a reality for outcomes and not just something that says, oh, that's a nice, another strategy, nice, another plan. It's going to be um, different and we've got to be held, the Welsh Government's got to be held accountable for it, but actually so as every other, a, a, any other body with power in Wales, and that includes local authorities, the health service, private sector, third sector, they have got to own and deliver uh, the race equality plan for an anti-racist Wales. Um, I just said certain things that are happening already, and I'll stop now, uh, that we already have committed uh, and committed in cabinet and obviously seeking getting the resource to a race disparity unit because we do need data. I can see there's a point coming up in the in the chat. Um, we have we're going to have a race disparity unit within an equality data unit, the heart of government, uh, because that's you know one of the ways in which we will be, be really be able to not only use that data in terms of the outcome, but also outcomes, but also plan policy and budgets around it. I just I also just wanted to say there's a very strong link to other aspects of my portfolio and everything, you know, so there'll be other things that will emerge, not just from the plan, but other intersectional issues that will emerge from from this as well. So, I mean, I'm in terms of, you know, we're just about to go into a, uh, an, uh, an equally sort of important working group about disability and the impact of coronavirus. On disabled people. There will be an intersectional aspect to it, um, also in terms of LGBT plus gender, etc. Those will and those plans are that plan is under consultation at the moment. But also I'm responsible for tackling poverty. Tomorrow we've got a cross-party group on poverty. There's a huge interaction there with the race equality action plan. Um, and also we are now implementing our socioeconomic duty. So all of these things, I mean, tackling poverty and inequality is, is inextricably uh, linked. Uh, and, you know, that comes out through the socioeconomic aspects of the plan. So I hope that's just a bit of a, a bit of a way through. I see there's quite a lot here about the uh, police courts and sentencing bill as well. Um, you know, we, this is not with it. We don't have powers over, over it. We have, um, we will have what's called a legislative consent motion, which is actually being discussed at the moment in the committee in the uh, Senate, Legislative Constitutional Justice Committee, um, where we are resisting, particularly in terms of Gypsy Traveller, Roma, this the whole criminal, you know, this it, the fact that they're saying the UK government want the police to be able to um, deal, you know, in, a, a totally wrongly um, harass pe uh, people on sites, basically. So we're, you know, we're resisting all of that and we're resi resisting what as much as we can. But I mean, I'm afraid that doesn't necessarily mean we'll have any Im impact and there will be opposition amendments in Westminster from across some of the parties, um, opposition parties, I'm sure. Jane, thank you very much for that. I'm so apologise for dropping out of the meeting. I've had some broadband problems, I'm afraid, this morning. I hope um, I can stay with you. Um, we've got very little time, so questions are going to have to be brief and, and answers. Um, who would like to begin? I think we had Trudy first. Trudy, um, yeah. yeah. Trudy Aspinwall, please. Morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name's coming up as Andrew Betridge as well, but I'm Trudy Aspenwall from the Travelling Ahead Project, working with Gypsy Roma and Traveller families around Wales. Um, good morning, Minister. Um, thank you for that update. 
my question was around um, the Welsh Government commitment to reject any anti-Gypsy and traveller policy that you've really clearly laid out in the Race Equality Action Plan. We really welcome that. I'd wanted an update on what progress has been made um, and what steps the Welsh Government can take to disapply Part 4 of the police bill in Wales. Um, and I think you've, you've, you've answered that in part. So perhaps I'll just go on to my second part of that question, which was that, that if the police bill comes in in Wales, then gypsy and traveler families will be left very vulnerable to prosecution. And as you say, harassment potentially by not just the police, but by private landowners who can, um, who can initiate this legislation if it goes through. Um, the answer, one of the many answers to that is to make sure that gypsy and traveller families have adequate permanent um, accommodation and also to facilitate the nomadic way of life and have proper transit provision and stopping places. What actions can the Welsh Government take um, under the Race Equality Action Plan or in other ways to ensure that the legal duty that already exists under the Housing Act, which many local authorities are failing to meet, what accountability and what actions can the Welsh Government take to make sure that um, councils do um, meet their duties and local families are not left in this in this awful position where they have nowhere legal to place their caravans yet could be open to prosecution. Well Thanks. thank you very much Trudy. Um, you know you're absolutely right. I, I'm, I've made it very clear uh, to the UK government that we're um, against the um, those sections of the bill which create an offence. Um, people may be, I hope everyone's aware of the, it would create a, an offence of residing in a vehicle on land without consent. Uh, so we're um, opposing that. It would risk, as I say, criminalising a traditional nomad, nomadic way of life um, and, uh, and also um, loss of home, of a home. Now, I think one of the things I'll just say on that in terms of what we can do if it goes through is tr try and work, although it's not devolved, yet we work with our police force forces in Wales. I chair a policing and partnership board. So I think this is really important that we raise the profile of what this could mean. Um, and I, that's, what, that's why it's good to have this raised this morning. But you're absolutely right. What we've got to do is get make sure that our local authorities are delivering on their commitment. Um, yes, it's good to see. Jude Jenny Rathbone making this point here about failing to provide a site in their um, in their areas. So I mean we have um, we're funding. Just checking the figures. We're funding currently projects worth 1.2 million. Um, that I mean some authorities are coming forward for funding to refurbish existing sites, which is is which is good. Constructing new pitches. You'll be aware of this, um, Trudy but it's not taking place in every part of Wales that we actually have, have sites. We've got the legislation um, and we're working with every local authority to try and get this implemented, um, as well as to support you in planning ahead. So thanks for that point. I think what we will do is again, perhaps update, update this group, cross-party group on where we haven't got, where we haven't got sites. I mean, um, some members will be aware that this has ra been raised in the chamber recently. We have to stick together on this um, because we need we need all local authorities to deliver on their obligations under the Housing Wales Act 2014, and it's um, critically important because the two the two issues come do come together, as you say, Trudy. And um, thank you for that point. So John, I'll, I'll update on where we are. Um, and I may, it may be useful to perhaps for me to do a, a written statement or something quite soon on where we are on this, as it's sort of this interface with the police bill as well. Yeah, no, I think that'd be very useful and it would be a good airing of the issues and give members of the Senate an opportunity to raise points and, you know, hopefully add to the pressure for change to what's currently proposed. Oh, okay, Jane, I see Babylon Mollick has um, the hand raised. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, John. 
Um, I, I just wanted to pick up, Jane, um, you know, um, on that terminology bit that you, you mentioned. I know it's difficult, and I've been in those discussions that um, there was no concise view, basically, which way to go forward with it. But at the moment, as it stands, different, you know, organisations, different institutions interpreting uh, minority communities as, and, as they please. In, oh, and that's a bit of a confusion. Uh, I don't know if you remember when you were health minister, Jane, um, and you launched EHU and my ethnic minority access to those extended eye health examinations. Yes. Now that um, I, I've been discussing and discussing because they, they class that as a black and Asian qualified, but other communities don't. And, you know, we know there's many new communities coming in to Wales now with, you know, the Middle Eastern um, issues, et cetera, going on. And, I've been saying these communities are coming with similar concerns of health. I've given them papers to evidence, you know, they've got higher risk factors as we did um, in South Asian population, but there, there seems to be a reluctant to, you know, um, you know, include those communities within that category. And I just wanted, you know, um, to point that out to you that until we can clearly define what this means and what the terminology is, people will misuse or disuse the mm. term and um, there will be communities that will, the, the needs will never be met basically. And that's a bit of a concern. So I wanted to bring that to you. Well, thank you very much, Bablin. Uh, thank you for bringing this to my attention. That takes me back a long way um, when I was uh, in that role, but I will raise it now with the current health uh, minister because if it's still, if that limited, terminology and definition is still being used it, it, it is clearly going to be exclusive so I will um, I mean actually uh, I think Usha or someone on the call from Mont will be able to to pick this up but because you know that's an example of how in the end we probably at the moment are using black Asian minority ethnic but spell it you know say the full black Asian minority ethnic as cover in terms of services we've got to make sure it's as inclusive as possible and that's the difficulty about limiting terminology in any way so uh, thank you for that Bablin. that's really helpful and we'll follow it up okay thank you both um robert moore thank you yes minister you you mentioned that this was a new way of making policy and I think those of us who are involved in the making of the policy found it very inspiring uh, and we felt that you know, real progress was, was going to be made. And I just want to know how we went from that stage to a published consultation policy document, which was very flat and uninspiring. And I know many people who were involved in developing this policy share my view. We would like to know what happened between that very exciting and inspiring process and the production of what is basically a rather dull document. Well, thank you very much, Robert. I'm obviously disappointed to, to have that uh, feedback because in the end, I mean, it was it's a huge document, isn't it? It was very difficult to to make sure all uh, all the inspiring engagement that you you know you were part of was reflected in that document. I found what was good about the document was the fact that there's so many um, lived experience um, views were factored in throughout the document. I mean, it is you may not you know you may feel that it isn't wasn't what were you perhaps would have uh, like to have seen, but I think it was a very different document. But I think the point is that the engagement and that you had, and the fact that the response to the document, including when includes a lot of that, uh, sort of enhances a lot of that engagement, and the fact that we've had all these videos and you know pe pe people responding in such a different way as well, I think is is really positive and constructive. So, yes, I mean, obviously, we could have spent months writing a doc. We, we wanted to get that plan out. I mean, that's one of the issues, as you know, Robert. We needed to get that plan published before the end of the last Senate in order for it to be part of, or well, certainly, manifesto commitments and get it out. So there was 
a lot of pressure on time as you will, as everybody knows, but let's hope that what comes forth and this equality, first of course, are independently analyzing the responses and what comes forth as I hope is very practical. It's about the outcomes, it's the delivery, the implementation um, that I think people will want to see. Uh, but we did have a very positive response when I made a statement in the chamber in the Senate, just about probably the last day of term. I mean, what's important is we got that out, but obviously our very much, our, and our officials will take on board everything that you said, Rob, Robert, and anyone else in terms of you know, the, the state of the document as it was. It was very interesting that that came out just before the, um, the, the, the response, the Sewell report in, in England, the UK government, and you know the headline of where a race equality plan for an anti-racist Wales. You can't underestimate the power of that in itself. Um, and then what we will have to then what we will have to deliver with it. Okay, thanks, Jane. Um, we've got about three minutes, but I see is it Dahlia has uh, the hand raised. Uh, if you could be brief, Dahlia, and Jane brief in your answer, that that would be useful. No problem. Thank you. And good morning, uh, Minister and everyone. Uh, just a quick one. I'm just concerned that, of course, it's difficult to um, we spent a lot of time saying BAME, B-A-M-E, B-M-E. I'm just concerned we're going to spend even more time coming up with another name that may yet exclude more communities. So I'm, I'm very much in favour of getting together and putting action. Let's work together to do the action instead of spending more time and effort, including or excluding folks. For me personally, I feel sort of, you know, having names just excludes us anyway. Just putting us in a box and calling us this kind of group is, is, uh, is not inclusive in my opinion. Um, so I really want to sort of work together with everyone to ensure that everyone is absolutely in, in, in included with that as the whole point of, of this of this meeting. But I just wanted to raise the point that I'm concerned we're going to spend more time and effort going around to find the right terminology or acronyms for that. Um, Minister, you mentioned that you work with poverty and inequality. I'm, I'm, I work separately as a volunteer for preventing food waste. I believe the amount of food that is wasted um with supermarkets and stores is 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 criminal if i'm honest um so i think it's really important to get all the supermarkets involved actively because the amount of decent food that's wasted no one in this country should ever um go hungry really with the amount of food that's wasted here just as a separate point i don't want to take up too much time but thank you for listening thank you very much Dalian. and i you know i agree completely on your first point and you know you citizens of wales and how we focus on, on a particular dis, you know, disparities um, that arise. So thank you. We've got to be inclusive of you know, only all, all issues and needs. But for, I suppose it's detected characteristics as well, which does the Equality Act, which is crucially important. And I mean, yes, uh, because I'm responsible for tackling poverty and tackling food poverty, perhaps Dahlia could have a meeting um, to follow up the work that you're doing, because we've just um, issued a, a, a quite a lot of grants uh, for tackling food poverty with EU transition funding, which will be with us no more. Um, but a lot of that was a kind of sustainable ways of tackling child uh, food, food poverty using um, food waste. And of course, fair share, uh, as you know, is, is sort of part of that in terms of the um, the work that we're doing. So, uh, can I, can, I'm, I'm not sure, Dalia, if we've had a meeting before, but I'd like to do a particularly look at your work. Thank you. I'd, I'd really welcome that. I'll, I'll leave my email here and I'd love to do that. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Jane, and thank you, everyone, for taking part in the meeting today. We'll make sure that all the relevant documents are circulated to everybody who's um, been part of the meeting and um, the minister's update uh, as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Minister, and thank you, Christina. And look forward to seeing you all again at the next meeting. Joe, thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. Bye, everyone. Bye. John and Ross, do you want to just stay on a minute? Really? Thank you all.